Okay, next let us evaluate the same structure in six dimensions, d equals 6 minus 2 epsilon. Let us do it exactly in the same order as before, starting with one loop, then one loop counter term insertion, and then two loop. As I announced before, the difference will be that the, count, the one loop diagram will be momentum independent, even its divergent part, and therefore we need to deal a lot with uh, inserting a momentum dependent counter term into this one loop counter term Feynman diagram. So this will be the most difficult part. Let us first write down again the power counting, just to get an overview. Omega of the one loop diagram, H, is now 2. Omega of the reduced diagram, G over H, is now 0, because 3 propagators and 6 dimensions. And omega of the full graph is also plus 2, so we have a superficial divergence, this time also at the two loop level. As I said, let us begin by calculating the one loop diagram. And uh, we again only evaluate the T integration, which is the one loop subdivergence, or here the one loop superficial divergence. So if we look at the T integral, then we have here dt, T now, omega is 2, so we get T to the power minus 3 plus 2 epsilon times a, a function g of T. And according to our general formula, we can evaluate this um, around epsilon equals 0 by analytic continuation. So the integral diverges, of course. So this is continuous in t, also at t equals 0. But this is uh, extremely divergent. But we can analytically continue by definition. And uh, the analytic continuation gives 1 over 2 epsilon times the second derivative with respect to t at t equals 0 divided by 2 factorial. So what we need this time uh, is a derivative in terms of t. That is the difference. And actually, the, the evaluating the derivative is not so difficult. So here, we need a second derivative with respect to t of a function g which really, actually, only depends on the variable t square. So if we remember, it depends on t via this wh, and that just contains explicitly t square. And uh, nowhere else there is actually a dependence on t. So this dependence is quite simple, and we need it at t equals 0. So if you think that you t take a derivative with respect to t, uh, then you get an inner derivative, g derived with respect to t square times 2 times t, in a derivative, then you derive once again with respect to t, then what remains at t equals 0 is just 2 times the first derivative with respect to the variable t square of g of t square at t equals 0. So that's rather simple. So we only need the first derivative of the object with respect to t square in this particular case. And we can easily evaluate this. Let's do it here. So we need d by dt square of our exponent wh. So the wh was written over here before, and it just contained t square explicitly as a prefactor. So the remainder is q square times beta divided by 1 plus beta. Let us, since we will need it later on, abbreviate this as q square times the remainder function wh tilde. So in other words, the wh tilde is the beta over 1 plus beta. So this is the interesting dependence on our integration variables. Q square is the momentum, so let's factor it out. Then uh, we would also need d by dt square of our d tilde h, but that is 0 because d tilde h is just 1 plus beta. And then we also need everything evaluated at t equals 0. So if we take this wh at t equals 0 itself, without derivative, it's of course 0, since it's proportional to t square. Therefore, overall, d by dt square of our function g would be d by dt square 
of e to the i w h times d tilde h uh, to the power minus d over 2. So this is now uh, only um, getting a contribution from this prefactor i times the derivative of w h, which is i q square w h tilde times the rest evaluated at t equals 0. So that becomes 1 and that remains whatever it is d tilde h to the power minus d over 2. So then we can plug that back in. We now have the result of our t integral of the one loop diagram. The t integral gives 1 over 2 epsilon times that what we have over there divided by 2 factorial plus something finite. So we can plug in all the prefactors and write down the divergent part of uh, the one loop diagram. With all the prefactors we get minus i square times the factor 2 times, now again we can do it in one step, so we get the coefficient of 1 over epsilon, so in the coefficient we set d equal to 6 always, so here we get for example the loop factor c6 explicitly. Then we have 1 over epsilon from here. Uh, then times the result of our integrand. This is i times q square. And uh, we can factor that out and then remains the beta integral. And the beta integrand contains now only this remainder function w h tilde, which appears here times d tilde h to the power minus 3. So here d is 6, therefore this becomes now minus 3. And the epsilon has been set to 0. That is the result. And we can set this to the following. Uh, let's set it to minus q square times c tilde h a. Then uh, the counter term is minus the divergent part of the two loop diagram. And now our counter term is q square dependent, so it's not a momentum independent constant, but it's quadratic in the momentum. So we write the counter term as this combination q square times a coefficient c tilde of h. Then c tilde um, h is everything here except for the factor q square. So this is a constant. And we can check what it is. Actually, just for fun, let us evaluate this integral to uh, see a connection to our first lectures where we also had the same calculation. So what is actually the coefficient of the divergence here? Um, we can again write this as an integral over a new integration variable x from 1 to 2 by replacing x equal 1 plus beta. Okay. If we do that replacement, then uh, the integral becomes very simple because this d tilde h is now just uh, x itself. And so we get here 1 over x cubed. Then the w h tilde in the numerator it has beta, so this is x minus 1. And in the denominator we have x, so we get here x to the fourth. So this is our integral, so we get 1 over x cubed minus 1 over x to the fourth, integrated over x. And so, of course, this gives then uh, here minus 1 over 2x squared plus 1 over 3x cubed evaluated between 1 and 2. And if you evaluate it, then you get from here uh, 1 over 8 uh, minus 1 over 2. And here you get, um, sorry, Yes, 1 over 8 minus 1 over 2. And here you get uh, 1 over 24 minus 1 over 3. And if you combine it, then you get overall minus 1 over 12. 
And uh, that corresponds exactly to our divergence that we had. In the first few lectures, we calculated the same and we obtained the result of the divergence Q squared divided by six. Now we get Q squared divided by 12. And the factor two comes from the fact that we have considered one out of two equivalent sectors. So the overall result is twice that. Actually, we get here plus one over 12. So the new thing is we have a momentum dependent result. So this is the new result, and we need to take into account the momentum dependence of the counter term once we insert it into the counter term Feynman diagram here. So it makes no sense at all to say this is a, uh, a term C H A, which we can multiply here with this integral because we have no way to treat the momentum dependence at this level. So we need to back up a little bit and see how we can treat such a momentum dependence in terms of an alpha integration. And that is now a new job for us uh, that will uh, occupy us for the next few minutes. So let me delete this. Okay, next let us deal with the one loop counter term diagram where we now know that the cross means Q square times a constant. And how can we calculate this? Let us be explicit once again. So when, with our momentum assignment here flows in P, then we have here the loop momentum Q plus P. Here we have the loop momentum Q and our propagators are denoted by three, four, and five. As I said, we have to back up a little bit to see how we can treat the Q square dependence. So Q square is first defined, of course, in momentum space. That means we have to first start with our uh, momentum space integration. And our momentum integral is, of course, very straightforward. We have this uh, counter term Q square times a constant C tilde H. And then in our denominator, we have the three propagators, D3 times D4 times D5. That's all. And uh, the propagators, D3 and D4, they are equal. They are just one over Q square. And uh, the propagator five is P plus Q square. Now we can calculate this in two ways. And the first way is uh, direct. So the obvious thing that you can do if you look at the integral, then this is not difficult at all because you have Q square here divided by Q square. So nothing could be simpler than that. You can cancel Q square divided by D3 and uh, they vanish without any trace. And what is left is just one over D4 times D5. So let's cancel Q square. And then what remains is just an integral one divided by d4 d5. And that has, of course, the structure of a completely standard one loop two point function with two propagators, which we have calculated already many times, including today. And then we can, of course, introduce for that an alpha parametrization if we want. So in general, it's easy to calculate it, but uh, the problem is this calculation does not lead to a structure which we can easily compare with our two loop calculation because we would like to express this in terms of integral over Tg, beta three and beta four. And this will not lead to such an expression. Therefore, what we would like to do is to keep 
introducing the alphas in exactly the same way as before, which means we should keep our three propagators with this, this exact structure, D3, D4, D5, but treat the Q square somehow in a different way. So we introduce the alphas first and take into account the Q square, which is a non-trivial numerator. in the setup of our alpha parametrization. And this is now a new thing because so far in our alpha parametrization we always assumed that the numerator of the loop integrals is one. And so now we have Q square in the numerator and uh, the question is how can this be dealt with when we set up alpha parameters? And actually it can be dealt with and uh, so this is now necessary. But uh, let us do both calculations to have a check and to see how both methods work. So let's first do the direct calculation. So the direct calculation, we have this counter term diagram and this is now the same as uh, C tilde HA, this constant divided by D4, D5. And uh, this is, of course, then simply d tilde ha times a normal one-loop diagram, which is c tilde ha times uh, minus i square. We know it times loop factor cd times an integral over two variables, tg and an overall beta times 2 t to the tg to the power of the degree of divergence, which is now this degree of divergence, which is 2, so tg to the power minus 3 plus 2 epsilon, then e to the i of the appropriate w, and the appropriate w is the one for this one, which is our famous wh, which however now depends on tg and this beta. And then we get also the same structure d tilde h for that kind of diagram which is 1 plus beta and uh, the exponent is minus 3 plus epsilon. So this is the explicit result. That's the end. So it's simple to obtain and uh, simple result and simple calculation. The problem is that it is difficult to compare and also difficult to combine with the two-loop calculation of that diagram because the integration variables will now be different. So in the combination we would have from here an integral over Tg, beta 3 and beta 4 and here we have an integral over Tg and beta and so how can we combine the two integrals to see that the resulting integration is finite? That is difficult and that is why this method of calculation is not so optimal to see the finiteness of the result. So that is the problem. And in order to solve this problem, we now do the second kind of calculation, which is the calculation of introducing alphas while we have a non-trivial numerator. And that involves a new technique, which I will show you. So let us now do the more general calculation, which takes into account the numerator. And there is a general trick for numerators in terms of alpha parameters. And the general trick is the following. So let us imagine we have an integral over many loops, k1 to kl. And we have a function of all 
äh, Momenta in the numerator and in the denominator we have the usual product of all propagators of all the internal lines to 1 to capital E. So all the propagators have the form dk is equal to some line momentum lk square minus the appropriate mass mk square plus i epsilon and these line momenta each line has a momentum lk these are always linear combinations of loop momenta the ki and the pi pi would be the external momenta So in a general way, I would call K always the loop momentum and P always the external momentum and any momentum of any internal line is a linear combination of the two. And we might have any linear combination or a product of any of those momenta in the numerator. If we have loop momenta here, then this plays a role in the integration and we would like to deal with it. So on the other hand, any loop momentum ki can always be written as a linear combination of the line momenta in special cases of course one line momentum is exactly equal to one of the loop momenta but even in general it's always a linear combination of these LK. That means whatever function we have in the beginning, any uh, momenta external or a loop momentum, we can always bring it to a form if we want to have uh, here a function only of the line momenta of all the internal lines. So this function can be written as a function of the set of the momenta of all the internal lines LK. That is always possible. And therefore now our general recipe is to write uh, any such line momentum, let's say L I1 or K1 to the power mu1 um, times L K2, uh, sorry not power but uh, Lorentz index mu2 Many of them can be written as a derivative of an exponential function e to the i sum of lk dot uk sum over all the internal lines k. u are new variables and then we take the derivative minus i d by d u k1 with a Lorentz index mu1 and the derivative minus i d by d u k2 with Lorentz index mu2. And if we act on this exponential function, then each derivative with respect to such a variable u, so these variables are Lorentz four vectors, each derivative pulls down uh, the appropriate line momentum, lk, with the appropriate Lorentz index, the i cancels, And if we now set at the end all these u's to zero, then this complicated construction reproduces exactly the left-hand side, any product of any combination of line momenta. Okay? So we can replace the line momenta by derivatives with respect to such new Lorentz four-vector variables u. There is one u for each internal line, and we have to insert an exponential function with this linear combination of line momenta times the new u variables. So this is the idea. This is the trick to rewrite line momenta by derivatives with respect to new variables u. 
And then we insert an exponential function and that fits of course very well to our alpha parametrization because in the alpha parametrization anyway, we write each propagator as some integral over an exponential function and that exponential function can be combined with this one and uh, then we go on with our usual alpha parametrization. So if we now proceed, then imagine you have any such combination of L's in the numerator and the denominator is the product of the D's. Then you do this replacement, then you end up with an integral with the same denominators, many derivatives with respect to U and an exponential function. So now you do the usual alpha parametrization. So you introduce the alphas. This construction here is completely independent of this alpha introduction. Then uh, what happens from the uh, alphas, you got an exponential function and in the exponent we always had this sum over di times the alpha i. Now what we have are two exponential functions and we can simply say that the difference is that this gets an additional term, namely from all the lines momenta of uh, Li times Ui. And these are two four vectors, by the way. So this is the change. And uh, then we should write this. Uh, we should take, let's say we call this K double prime square, the overall um, loop momentum square with a new normalization minus then this linear term J transpose times the matrix M to the power minus one times J plus a constant K minus another constant K prime. That was always our structure and we can do exactly the same kind of calculation just with our modified exponential function. The uh, structure is the same because the exponent still is a function of all the loop momenta up to loop momentum square. It has linear terms and uh, loop momentum independent terms. So we can go through exactly the same procedure of completing the square and writing it in this form. And what changes in this calculation is, uh, this brings in new linear terms in the loop momenta, because this can be linear in the loop momentum, and it introduces new constant terms which are independent of the loops. But it does not introduce new quadratic terms. So in our calculation, this matrix M contains a quadratic term, so this is unchanged. And uh, J contains the linear term, so this gets modified. And uh, the constant K contains um, loop momentum independent terms, this gets also modified uh, from this. So J and K get modified. And uh, the constant K prime was what we called the thing with the I epsilon prescription and with the masses. This is unchanged. Okay. So and uh, you can calculate in general this modification, but we don't need to do that right now. But we can clearly see that in this way we can get a new alpha parametrization for any integral where we have an arbitrary combination of momenta in the numerator. And we will end up with something, an integral over alpha with a semantic polynomial u to the power minus t over 2. And this semantic polynomial is the same as we always had. It doesn't change by uh, having a numerator times e to the iw, and so the w has changed. w is now equal to w uh, for these variables u equals zero as before, plus additional terms, and the additional terms in our w, they come from the modified j and the modified k. They contain terms proportional to u and terms proportional to u square. So it goes up to quadratic terms in all these new u variables. That is the modification. And uh, so we need this now for the first time here today, but actually you can uh, 
guess that this is of course important in general because in many cases you want to calculate Feynman diagrams with non-trivial numerators. This is by far not only important for counter terms, but it is of course important in general. And this is the recipe to do it uh, in general if you have arbitrary numerators in Feynman diagrams and you want an alpha parametrization. So now let's go back to our concrete example. Our concrete example is not very complicated uh, with respect to this. We only have one simple Q square in the numerator and we have one propagator, actually two, D3 and D4, which contain precisely that Q square in our denominator. So writing our Q square here in terms of such U variables is extremely simple. So we could go all the way and introduce U's for all propagators, but actually it's not important. We, in our case, need much less. We need just one single variable u, and let's just keep uh, doing the simplest uh, thing possible. We introduce only one u, not for each line, but for one line, let's introduce a variable u for our line three. And then we can write the q-square numerator as a derivative with respect to the u variable of propagator three, which contains q-square in the denominator. So that should be the easiest option. And uh, it illustrates the general recipe, however, in, uh, in a quite simple way. So here, we only need uh, much less. So we have here in our line, line number three runs uh, momentum Q. And we need Q square which is uh, in that general notation, line three, momentum square. So the only necessary thing is to write down an exponential function, e to the i times q dot this single variable u. And uh, we don't need something like u4 and u5. Let's get rid of them. But then we can imagine going through the alpha parametrization. We need a modified J. What is actually the modification? So J is always the linear term in our loop momentum. So if you imagine this structure, sum over di alpha i plus the line momentum times u, then previously the linear term came from this propagator d5, which is p plus q square. So the linear term is 2p dot q times alpha 5. And j is one half of that. So the linear term previously was p times alpha 5. Now there is an additional linear term, namely exactly this one. So this gives an extra contribution to our j, and namely one half of that, so plus u over two. This is now our j. So the modification is the new term plus u over two, which is an extra linear term in the loop momentum q. What about our constant k? k was the loop momentum independent term in this structure here, the loop momentum independent term came from this propagator again, p squared times alpha five. That was always the result. And now does it change? No, it does not change because there is no extra momentum independent term, so this is unchanged. Therefore, we can obtain our modified W for this Feynman diagram, which includes now this extra exponential function. The modified W is given by the new J times N to the minus one times J plus K minus K prime. And so we know exactly what changes, namely J has changed. M has not changed, and M was uh, the semantic polynomial, which is one plus beta three plus beta four. So we know that. And so J has changed. So uh, we get the old thing. This is the, in the original notation, WG over H, uh, 
as before. This contains no variable u. And then we get linear and quadratic terms. So we get one linear term. So from here, from this u over 2 times p, so this gets squared here. So this is uh, all numbers, so there is no matrix multiplication. So we just get j square. So j square obtains then p dot q, uh, p dot u times alpha 5. So we get plus, sorry, minus 1 over m times p dot u times alpha 5. And uh, here u squared divided by 4, u squared divided by 4 divided by m, uh, so plus u squared divided by 4. That is the modification. And m is equal to u g over h is equal to 1 plus beta 3 plus 4. Okay, so we know exactly what changes and how it changes. Therefore, we can write down an alpha parameterized expression for this Feynman diagram. And including all the prefactors, we have now the full result. Namely, we have everything as before. The only thing that changes is this um, w. And uh, we get the derivatives with respect to this variable u. So we have minus i cube times, um, first uh, let's do it in alphas, alpha 3, 4, 5, times minus i derivative with respect to u mu square. That corresponds to our q square times the original semantic polynomial u g over h to the power minus d over 2 times the modified exponential function e to the i w modified. And after evaluating the derivatives, we should set u equal to 0. So now you have an explicit result for our alpha parametrization of this integral and the Feynman diagram. And uh, the new thing is the appearance of the derivative with respect to u and the modification of the exponent with terms linear in u and quadratic in u. But uh, overall, the modification is not very um, complicated and we can deal with it. We can evaluate the derivatives that is not difficult, and uh, we can therefore calculate the entire thing. Let us, however, bring it to the form of our sectors. So we now need to introduce sector variables. So what happens in terms of our sector variables? Then this uh, modified structure goes to the uh, wg over h as before, as before, but now in terms of t's and beta's, minus the extra term, and the extra term becomes now what? So alpha 5 is just tg square, and m is the semantic polynomial. Uh, there we can factor out a tg square as well. So we have here tg square factored out times our d tilde, tg square times d tilde g over h. And in the numerator, we have p dot u times tg square. So alpha is tg square. And uh, that just remains u square divided by 4. And in general, u g over h is given by t g square times t tilde g over h. And then we know everything. We also know, of course, our integration measure transformation. This gives the famous factor 2 and uh, t g to a certain power. That is all as before. And uh, hence, we can write down the full expression for this Feynman diagram. So 
let us write down the result in this generic approach. Uh, for our specific sector, let's call it sector A again. This Feynman diagram is now minus I cube times the usual loop factor CD times an integral over the variables TG, beta 3 and beta 4 and the integrand contains the two from the integration measure then Tg to the usual power minus omega g minus g over h minus 1 plus 2 epsilon. This has not changed at all because this comes from the measure and from the semantic polynomial. And then we have now our prefactor from the counter term c tilde h, this is just a numerical constant, times Q square and Q square has become the derivative with respect to U square. Minus I D by D U mu square. Then acting on the remaining integrand D tilde G over H to the power minus D over 2. Let's write explicitly minus 3 plus epsilon. Because this is now specific for six dimensions. Without six dimensions, we wouldn't have the derivative times e to the i w modified. And after evaluating the derivatives, we should set u to zero. This is now our expression. And at the beginning, I asked uh, the first blackboard today, uh, what does it mean to insert the counter term diagram into the two uh, into the one loop counter term diagram? Uh, and the answer is, this is it. So this corresponds to inserting minus the divergent part of uh, the one loop self energy. And therefore we can read off the general rule. The rule is that the external momentum of the divergent part which gets inserted into the outer diagram will be replaced by minus i derivative with respect to appropriate u variables. And here we have just one u variable and one momentum, but in general you might have several momenta and many variables u. But in general you can always replace such an external momentum by appropriate derivatives with respect to appropriate u's. And appropriately, you have also to modify the w in the exponent. So this has linear and quadratic terms in these u variables. In our case, the explicit expression is given here. So now we have it. And therefore, we can now finally completely do the calculation in this formalism. Remember that we already have calculated this diagram explicitly in terms of uh, cancelling the q square, but now let's do it in this formalism. So what we need to do in this formalism is to evaluate the derivative d by du mu of this e to the i w modified. And uh, this is an exponential, so we get e to the i w modified back times the inner derivative. And what is now the inner derivative of this uh, exponential function with respect to u. So the inner derivative comes from this extra term and the extra term gives as a derivative um, first derivative of this uh, term in the exponent times i, so minus i times the derivative with respect to u that gives p mu times tg square divided by tg square times d tilde g over h. Then the derivative with respect to u of the second term, u square, so that gives uh, 2 times u over 4, so gives minus i u 
mu divided by 2 divided by the same denominator t g square d tilde g over h. So, what is then the second derivative? d u mu, sorry, then a second derivative d u with upper index e to the i w modified. So, second derivative, we again, the prefactor reproduce it itself, and we get two terms. So, one is if we um, take again the derivative of the exponential function, we get the exponential function times this prefactor. So we get the same prefactor squared. That is one thing we obtain. And then we get uh, another term where we take the derivative of that uh, prefactor with respect to the variable u. What is the derivative of this round bracket with respect to the variable u? The variable u appears precisely here at this point, nowhere else. If we take the derivative of it with respect to itself, then we get, uh, first of all, the prefactors minus i um, divided by 2 times 1 over pg square d tilde g over h. And now the derivative d u um, mu of u mu. That is what we get. Now, let me write down as an extra expression what is actually this derivative. So, this is of course taken as a variable. Therefore, we get a Kronecker delta in general if we have here two different indices. And uh, in general, we get then the metric tensor with upper and lower indices mu mu, but summed over mu. So, of course, this implies a summation over the Lorentz index mu corresponding to the original Q square which we had in the integrand. Remember, we started with Q square in the numerator, this got replaced by this square, so we have still, this is a scalar product with contraction over Lorentz index, so, and that goes here. So we have this contraction, which is metric tensor G mu mu, summed over mu. And that is equal to the number of dimensions. And now you could actually ask yourself in dimensional regularization, for example, should you put the G mu mu to the number of original dimensions, which is 6, or should you put it to 6 minus 2 epsilon? And by definition, we put it to 6 minus 2 epsilon. In other words, we put it to the regularized dimension here. That is part of the definition of dimensional regularization. And we can keep track what is the implication of this choice of the definition. One thing that we can say immediately, it goes back to the uh, fact that this momentum Q square, which appears in the numerator, is a d-dimensional momentum. also on the regularized level. Otherwise, it could, for example, not cancel the propagator 1 over d q square. So in the original diagram, we have q square divided by q square. These are two d-dimensional momenta. If we say the numerator is six-dimensional, the denominator is d-dimensional, then there is no cancellation. We want this cancellation, and for this, we need the numerator to be d-dimensional. That means also the u variable is d-dimensional, and then this must also be equal to the number of dimensions d. Let me highlight a few lessons that we can also memorize later. This is certainly one of the lessons. So as a part of the definition of dimensional regularization, we put our momentum also in the numerator to be d-dimensional. This has this implication, and we can keep track of what are the implications of this. Uh, the other thing I wanted to highlight here is 
that fact over here. So if we have a momentum dependent counter term, then the momentum dependence gets in alpha parametrization replaced by such a derivative minus i d by d u with appropriate u variables. This is the other lesson. So, but now, let us uh, take our result. So, we have all the ingredients. This is the full expression for our integral. We have evaluated the derivative. So, uh, we can plug back this uh, result here. We get explicitly the number of dimensions. And here we get the whole thing square. But at the end, we set u to 0. Then this uh, simplifies a lot. And we can combine it and write it down, including the prefactors. So what we actually need is i square um, uh, times the second derivative of so du mu du mu acting on this e to the i w modified at u equals zero, and what that is uh, in the end is now the following. So if we put u to 0, then the w modified gets just to the normal uh, wg over h. So we get e to the i wg over h because the u's are now 0 times the following prefactor. And uh, the prefactor is this prefactor squared, uh, where u is 0, so that is only the first term minus times minus is plus p square divided by d tilde g over h square. And the tg has cancelled. Then plus the second term, uh, minus times minus gives plus, plus i. This is now the number of dimensions, d over 2. And in the denominator, we then have d tilde g over h. So this is the expression we get. And uh, sorry, tg to the power minus 2 remains as well. So we get a quite complicated prefactor. Let's look at it. We have here an explicit appearance of the external momentum, p square. Here we don't. We get different extra powers of our um, semantic polynomial d tilde g over h. Here we get two additional powers. Here we get one additional power. And here we even get an additional power of our integration variable tg. So it gets tg to the power minus 2. So minus 2 means the degree of divergence increases. So the lower the power, the stronger the divergence. So this increases the degree of divergence. And that is OK. Because actually our diagram here at the top, it has three propagators. So you would think uh, from looking at it, if you ignore the counter term insertion, then this would be um, degree of divergence zero. But the counter term contains q squared. Therefore, overall, the degree of divergence is plus two. There's a quadratic divergence. And this is reflected here. So this comes, of course, from the derivatives with respect to u. So they increase the degree of divergence, just like the original factor of q squared did. So this completely fits to the structure of the diagram. And now we have the result. This is the result. This is equal to minus i cube times the loop factor cd times our counter term coefficient c tilde h, the numerical prefactor of the loop momentum q square, times the integration of 2 times e to the i w g over h, times, uh, I copy this prefactor, and combine it with the remaining prefactor. So the remaining prefactor was d tilde g over h to that power minus 3 plus epsilon. That gets now modified. And the original tg at the exponent minus 1 plus 2 epsilon that gets now modified as well. So from the p square term, we get d tilde g over h 
to the uh, power minus 5 plus epsilon and t g to the original power minus 1 plus 2 epsilon and from the other term we get plus i d over 2 uh, times dg over h tilde to the power reduced by 1 minus 4 plus epsilon and tg appears to the reduced power minus 3 plus 2 epsilon. So and here now u is completely zero, the variable u doesn't exist anymore, therefore what we have here is the resulting expression of our counterterm Feynman diagram with counterterm insertion expressed as an integral over Tg, beta 3 and beta 4 with a certain integrand. The integrand is quite complicated, but the structure is exactly such that we will be able to compare it to the full two-loop diagram, which has the same integration variables. And of course, a related integrand as we already saw. And here again, I stress that this corresponds to the quadratic divergence of the diagram which we have now. This is not quadratic divergent, but it contains explicitly the momentum p square. So from dimensional analysis, we also expect a p square appearing in the result. So, but we can also compare it to the first calculation which we did by canceling the q square. Uh, that was a long time ago, and just to say it honestly, this is of course much more complicated. than the first calculation. Both the calculational procedure is more complicated and the formula that we obtain at the end is also much more complicated. But it has the same structure as the two-loop diagram. And that was the point. In particular, one aspect of this more complicated structure is that we have here in the integral two terms which have different uh, integrands. And uh, okay, we will have to see what happens to both of them. All right. Now I can ask whether we should do a consistency check. In my mind, if I see two calculations with such differing results, I want to do a consistency check and I want to explicitly verify now from the resulting formulas that they are actually identical. Because they certainly don't look identical, but it would be nice to reassure ourselves that actually the two results agree completely. And I would like to spend a few moments on verifying that so that you get some additional confidence in this method. And afterwards we will look at our two loop diagram. So let us just do such a consistency check. So our first result, let us call it A, had the structure integral Tg and beta. Let us get rid of the unimportant prefactors. Tg to the power minus 3 plus 2 epsilon times e to the i w h with the argument Tg and beta times the usual d tilde of h to the power minus 3 plus epsilon. And our second result is this one. And if I leave out the same prefactors, then it has this additional minus i because that comes cubed instead of squared. So we have minus i additionally. And the integral is over Tg, beta 3 and beta 4 and the integrand is e to the i g over h times uh, what we have there, 
P square P tilde G over H to the power minus 5 plus epsilon Tg minus 1 plus 2 epsilon plus the other term copied from over there. And these two expressions might be equal or are they not equal? Now, one thing that you should remember is that uh, what should be equal is the full Feynman diagram calculation. But actually, we are looking here at specific sectors. And the sectors we are looking at in A and B are different. In B, we are looking at a specific sector where two lines are, have a smaller alpha than the third line. In the first, we have completely eliminated one of the lines. Therefore, there is no alpha anymore for that one. And for the remaining two, one is smaller than the other one. So that corresponds to a different integration sector than this one. So for sure, for that reason, the integrals might not be completely the same. What should be the same is if we sum over all sectors for each of the versions of the calculation. But summing over all the sectors is now very easy by just remembering that actually the integration variables, they are completely general. What implements the sectors is the integration range beta from 0 to 1. So we can, even with these variables, we can completely do the full integration by just integrating beta up to infinity. So that we normally don't do it uh, because we don't want to, but we can. Nobody can stop us from integrating beta up to infinity. And if we do that, then the integrals should really be the same. So we go here beyond the sectors and we integrate all the beta i from zero to infinity. And then the question is whether this a is equal to b. And now let us make the following observation. Let me uh, write the integrand here including everything. So this is the integrand of the function a, f a, of beta. And uh, this integrand here is the integrand f b. And this depends on beta 3 plus beta 4. Remember that always the combination beta 3 plus beta 4 appears, but they are independent integration variables. So actually what we have to compare is the two uh, integrands and they look of course very different and the second one is much more complicated than the first in particular because of these two factors. But now let us take the derivative d by d beta of the first integrand f a of beta. Let's evaluate the derivative with respect to beta. Okay. So what is the derivative with respect to beta? So uh, here this is a factor, tg to the power minus 3 plus 2 epsilon. Doesn't matter. Then we have p to the iwh of the variable tg and beta. And uh, dh tilde to the power minus 3 plus epsilon. And now we can write the derivative as a factor. So if we take the derivative of the exponential function, we get the inner derivative i times derivative of wh with respect to beta. i times derivative of wh with respect to beta. That is one factor. Then we get the derivative from the d tilde. The d tilde gives us the following. Uh, if we take this derivative, we get minus 3 plus epsilon times the derivative of d tilde h with respect to beta divided by another d tilde h. That's just what we obtain. Now what is that? The derivative of wh with respect to beta. Remember that was beta divided by 1 plus beta. So the derivative is, um, it had the prefactor tg squared times p squared, then beta divided by 1 plus beta. The derivative is 1 divided by 1 plus beta minus beta divided by 1 plus beta square. So in the combination of the two, if we introduce the denominator uh, 1 over beta square, so we get tg square p square times 1 over 1 plus beta square. And that is actually tg square p square 
times d tilde h to the power minus 2. On the other hand, here the derivative of d tilde with respect to beta, d tilde is just 1 plus beta, so this derivative is 1. So we just get here 1 over d tilde h, that's all. What is that? So we have this prefactor, this prefactor times wh, d tilde of h, and then we have in the bracket t square. So this means in the first term we have tg to the power minus 1 plus 2 epsilon times p square times d tilde to the power minus 5 plus epsilon. That matches precisely this one here. So this is the first term if we look at the other integrand but replace beta 3 plus 4 by beta. So if we replace here beta 3 plus 4 by beta then this is just wh like here. And this is also just d tilde h, like here. So the first term matches. And also the second term matches because this bracket here is actually uh, minus d over 2. So that corresponds exactly to this d over 2 over there. And we also get the appropriate powers of tg. tg has the same power. And d tilde h gets the power from here minus 4 plus epsilon. So this is completely equal to our integrand f beta. Actually, up to the factor minus i. So let's get the factors right. So we have here an additional factor i. So it's i times f of beta. Is it i or minus i? Now it's i times f of beta. Hmm? Right. Okay, so this is a magical relationship. So therefore, we now see a light at the end of the tunnel. So A and B are related because actually this integrand here is a derivative of that integrand. Now we just have to match the variables and now we can do it as follows. So now let's start with our A. A is given as this integral Tg and the integral over beta from zero to infinity now of Let's do it like this. Derivative with respect to beta of beta, that is 1 times fa of beta. Okay, and now I introduce this uh, stupid derivative, that is 1, but now of course we can do partial integration. Partial integration means that this is equal to minus the integral over tg and the integral over beta of beta times the derivative with respect to beta of the integrand, and of course at the integration boundaries, beta equals zero, it vanishes, and at beta equal infinity, it also vanishes because of the exponential decay of the integrand. And uh, therefore, let's go on. So this is then equal to minus integral tg, integral over beta of beta, and that is now i times the other integrand, f of fb of beta. And now we just have to replace the integration variable beta by beta 3 plus 4. And of course we can do that by saying that this is first minus i, the minus i already matches tg beta 0 to infinity. And now let us write the beta here as an integral which is unnecessary but let's integrate from 0 to beta of a new variable beta 4 then we simply have here fb of beta. Then this integral does nothing except for reproducing the factor beta in front, but now we have a double integral over two variables, beta and beta 4, and we can the integration range is beta from 0 to infinity, beta 4 from 0 to beta, and that is the same as the integral over two variables, d beta 3, d beta 4, which both run from 0 to 
infinity and where we replace beta is equal to beta 3 plus beta 4. And then this is the same as B. And then we have completely proven the, explicity, uh, the explicit uh, equality between our two versions of the counterterm Feynman diagram. So we have again learned a lesson. We can calculate such diagrams with momenta in the numerator in different ways. We can cancel as much as possible at the level of the momentum integration and uh, then obtain maybe a simple calculations and simple results. But we can also do it in a brute force way by uh, replacing momenta by derivatives with respect to u, then introduce alphas in a systematic way, even though the calculation is then more complicated, it gives the same result. So that is very good to know. And now let us combine all the loose ends of today's lecture. And uh, we have now the complete result for our two-loop calculation. It is again written over there at the top. And uh, we can now combine it with a two-loop diagram and check how the divergences cancel.